So a few days ago, I showed you guys how to run your own Tor Relay at home, which is still a very good thing to do. There's really no risk, at least if you're running a middle relay and Tor isn't banned in your country. And it really helps out the Tor network. It adds a lot more bandwidth to it. It makes it a whole lot faster. But Tor is not the only kind of dark web or anonymity network out there. Another one that's not quite as popular as Tor, but is probably number two, is I2P. Now, there's a lot of similarity and differences between Tor and I2P. They both bounce your traffic through several different relays, as they're called in the Tor network, or routers, as they're called in I2P. Now, this is one of the big areas where I think I2P kind of beats Tor, because the tunnels that data travels through on I2P are unidirectional. They don't have these two-way circuits where data goes back and forth between you and the destination you're trying to access. In Tor, all that data flows through the same three relays both ways. In I2P, you have a tunnel for upload and a separate one for download, each one with a different chain of routers. So right off the bat, you'd have to compromise twice as many relays or twice as many routers rather, have twice as many of those routers be evil from the start to observe all of the traffic that's going through them. And another benefit of I2P is that every client, everyone who wants to browse on I2P is also going to be functioning as a router, at least when they're using its default settings. I believe you can technically configure your I2P client to just be a leech, but by default, your I2P client also functions as a router, which makes it much more decentralized. And when you think about it, that decentralization is essential for a dark web. With the Tor model, there's supposedly something like 2 million people that use Tor each and every day. I don't know if that is still accurate. Um, and only about 6,000 relays or 2,000 bridges are relaying all of this traffic, which combined is still less than half of 1% of the people that are actually using Tor, less than that, are actually contributing to the network. And there's really no benefit for the relay operators beyond just altruism, I guess. You know, you're just getting that sense of being a good person by being a relay operator. And of course, that's for the middle relay operators. The people who run the exit nodes are the real saints because oftentimes, they end up having to deal with law enforcement and getting their internet cut off and all types of other nonsense. With I2P, there is some incentive to keep your node running a lot longer, to keep relaying traffic for longer because it gets more integrated into the network. But that's kind of a double-edged sword. So I think that the main thing that's keeping I2P from being more widely adopted because compared to Tor, it's, it's nowhere near as popular. And I think part of that is the fact that you can't just fire up I2P and start browsing EAP sites. You have to have some patience. It takes a couple of hours for those tunnels to be made for you to connect to different routers that are all throughout the I2P network. It's kind of like when you first download a torrent, and really that's probably a good way to compare it to I2P since it's more of a peer-to-peer -peer network. It takes a while to connect to all of those different seeds and peers, but there is a way to deal with this to make it a whole lot better that doesn't require you running I2P on your main computer constantly, which let's face it, for a lot of people that's not going to be feasible. Some people are restarting their computers very often, maybe to boot into one operating system or another. And obviously you can't keep I2P running on that same system if you do it. So what you could do is just run it on a Raspberry Pi. I know some people might have one already that they may be using as a Pi hole, or maybe you actually have a Tor relay running on a Raspberry Pi or maybe an old ThinkPad like I do, or you could even have this running on a remote VPS. And then you can create an SSH tunnel to forward the port that you use for I2P, which is typically gonna be 4444. Now I know that that might all sound complicated, but the command is actually really simple. So this is what that command looks like. And all that I'm doing here is I'm SSHing 
into this machine at this IP address, which is a local IP. This is the same machine that I'm running my Tor relay on, and it's also an I2PD router, which I'm going to show you in a second. And I'm going to forward port 4444, uh, the port of the I2P router to localhost on the same port. And you know what else I can do? I can actually forward my router console as well. So that's something, oh, and I'm almost forgetting the L. So that's something that you should really only do if you're on your LAN. It's not a good idea to forward the router console over the internet because uh, that it can have some sensitive information on it. Oh, I also got an extra zero there. Uh, but yeah, you don't want to forward your uh, router console over the internet without taking some extra steps to secure it, which I'm not going to cover in this video. So you got to make sure that you go ahead and do that research on your own. But like I said, I'm on LAN, so it's no big deal. And we'll go ahead and enter the password. And bam, now we're tunneling. It didn't change the prompt here because these flags for SSH just passes you back to your regular terminal after you set up the tunnel. Now I'll show you how I have my I2P router slash Tor Relay configured, which is running Arch by the way. So what I'm running is not the vanilla I2P client that's written in Java, which by the way, before you ask, no I2P's Java client is not vulnerable to Log4j in any way. Uh, but regardless of that, I'm using I2PD, which is a C++ implementation of I2P. It's a much more minimalistic daemon. It uses far less resources. And of course, since it doesn't need Java, there's fewer packages that you're going to need to install on your system as well. And I2PD requires basically no setup. So you basically just install it from whatever package manager you're using and then you run it. Uh, here we go, running. So this shows you how to run it on different systems. I'm using the systemctl method since I'm running Arch. And that's pretty much it. Uh, one configuration that you might want to change, which I'll go ahead and show you. Uh, let's see, it's Etsy, i2pd, i2pd.conf. Uh, so yeah, this one here, you want to, enable your UPnP. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, it basically tells you here. So it's automatic port forwarding. Apparently it's enabled by default in Windows and Android, but it's not enabled on GNU Linux or BSD. So if you're running one of these on your home network, you're going to want to set that up so that it's not firewalled when you go to run I2P. Technically, you can use I2P when it's firewalled, but you won't be able to get as many connections if you do that. So make sure you change that if you are on a home network. Uh, oh, let me just quit out of this since I'm not root and didn't actually change anything. Uh, so there you go, that's how you run I2PD. Now let me show you how to browse I2P. So it's usually recommended to use a different browser than the one that you use for the clear web and to use a browser that is hardened against fingerprinting. Now, since I2P isn't a browser bundle like Tor is, you can technically use whatever you want, even Internet Explorer if you want to be a mad lad. But personally, what I would recommend is LibreWolf, which is sort of like a hardened fork of Firefox. Now to make LibreWolf for any browser be able to actually browse I2P, you've got to go into your settings and you've got to go into your network settings and you want to make sure your configuration is exactly like mine is here. So you want to use a manual proxy configuration, set your HTTP proxy to be 127.0.0.1 and the port to be 4444 or whichever port you were using for I2P that you were tunneling over here. Of course, you have to make sure that this port that you're tunneling is the same one that I2P is configured for, but this is just the default one and most likely the one that you're gonna be using. 
uh, and then put your no proxy for localhost and 127.0.0.1. And there you go. That's pretty much all you have to do. Oh, and one other thing. Um, let me see if I can find it. I know I changed it because it got kind of annoying. I think it's in here. Yeah, so by default, LibreWolf is in HTTPS only mode. And I2P, I don't remember whether or not it's possible to do HTTPS over I2P, but most all of the sites are just HTTP anyway. So uh, it's, it's kind of the same deal with Tor where it's encrypted, just not with SSL. So don't worry, there is encryption within I2P, but you'll probably want to change the setting just so that it doesn't pop up every single time and tell you, oh, this site is unsafe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so anyway, let's actually start going to some sites or actually I'll go to the router console first. So again, this is only going to work if you actually forwarded this and I'll actually copy this to make uh, getting into it quicker. All right, so this is the router console for I2P. So you can see that the network status is okay. It's gonna show firewalled if you didn't do the UPnP setting like I showed you. Uh, we can see my tunnel creation success rate is actually pretty good. Anything, I think they consider anywhere from like 30 to 40% to be good and I've got quite a bit over it. That's basically how reliable your network is for actually creating tunnels. Uh, and then you can see how much I've sent and received, blah, 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 and we're not gonna show the sensitive stuff. Um, and yeah, by default, um, so you don't have these other protocols enabled. So that's another thing that I guess you could enable if uh, you wanted to, but I haven't personally messed with them yet. So let's actually go to some EAP sites now. Let's try the ones that everybody goes to. So these are just gonna be, and actually I'll try a couple because I know I've been connected for an hour, but don't know for sure if uh, I'll be able to connect to all of these. Okay, so here's one that loaded, reg.itp. So these, this is a site that contains a lot of other EAP sites that you can visit. So if we go to a live, which is just gonna show us different ones that were recently found, um, let's see, I think most of these are okay to show on YouTube, although I don't know how many are actually gonna load right now since I've only had this node up for about an hour. Um, okay, here we go. So this is one where you can download an Arch Linux ISO over I2P. And it looks like Identity Guy loaded as well. So yeah, again, these are all different I2P sites, basically hidden services that you can go to. And just because they're hidden services, I, I know that there's, you know, some people have a negative connotation with the dark web. It doesn't necessarily mean that these are drug sites or some kind of illegal hacker site. Honestly, the vast majority of these that I've gone to are basically just different kinds of blogs. Like um, th there's a couple of pretty cool ones too. Uh, this one's kind of cool, kill dash nine. Um, I believe that they have an onion site as well that I've seen on tour before. And uh, yeah, there's, there's gonna be some Monero stuff because of course there is, this is a type of dark web. Yeah, this gives you an idea of some of the stuff that's on I2P. Of course, there's gonna be images of Lane all over the dark web. There's actually some pretty cool stuff on here. I, I think honestly, a lot of the people that think that um, I2P is really lame, just haven't been connected long enough or probably didn't even have their connection set up right to begin with. Because like I said, this would be a whole lot worse if my network status was firewalled. And I think the first time I actually did show I2P, uh, it was firewalled where I was using the Java client, which is, it, it's funny, most people are using the Java client and the Java client is actually more difficult to use than the non-vanilla I2PD client. Oh, so one other thing I'll show you guys is my remote I2P node and how you can view the console there. Because like I said, you don't want to forward 7070 over the internet, but you really don't have to. So let me SSH into that.
and this is running OpenBSD. So it's also a uh, I2P uh, router. You can see the I2PD service that I've got running on it. And obviously we don't really want to bloat up this system because I've only got, I think, like one virtual core assigned to it and obviously not a lot of memory. But you can install Lynx, which is pretty minimalist itself, and you can just go to that uh, local host on that port 7070. Uh, oh, I think I have to do HTTP for it as well. Let's see, HTTP. There we go. So yeah, this will let you see all of the relevant information. You honestly don't need to view your router console, at least in my opinion, in a GUI browser because pretty much everything you're gonna want to look at is text anyway, like your network status, how long it's been up, uh, what your uh, tunnel creation success rate is, which this one is really good, uh, and all of that stuff. And I think I actually do have to sensor some of this info because it is showing some yeah sensitive things like the router identity so gotta remember to do that correctly in this video this time uh but yeah that is how you can run i2pd on either a local computer raspberry pi thinkpad whatever or a vps Honestly, you should just start running it alongside the Tor node that you run at home. You do run a Tor node at home, right? I mean, come on, don't be a scrub. All the cool kids run Tor nodes at home. But that's it for this video, guys. Be sure to like and comment to hack the algorithm, and have a great rest of your day.